Let's look at a simple question. How does an airplane like my Bonanza climb? I thought the wings generated lift. Lift, right? That's what I thought makes an airplane climb when I first flew. After all, climbing means defying gravity, and lift does that, right? Lift? No. It turns out lift is not what makes an airplane climb. Remember Newton's first law of motion from physics class? It says an object will not change its motion unless a force acts on it. And we all intuitively understand this in unaccelerated straight and level flight, where thrust and drag and lift and weight cancel each other out to a resulting net force of zero. To start a climb from level flight, we need to accelerate the aircraft, not forward, but upwards. And according to Mr. Newton, that does take a non-zero net force pointing up, meaning that we need, for just a moment at least, a larger amount of lift, until our flight path has been curved upwards and a vertical speed is established. But once it is established, there is a balance again between upward and downward forces, and the airplane continues its motion on the new trajectory. No additional lift is needed compared with level flight. There is one other thing though, and that has to do with energy. You probably know there are different forms of energy, including potential, which comes from the height of an object, and kinetic, which comes from the motion of an object. Looking at this pendulum, you can see how potential and kinetic energy change over time, while the sum of both remains constant, if we disregard friction for a moment. When the pendulum goes up, it slows down, because the gain of potential energy can only come at the expense of kinetic energy. The same happens when an airplane climbs. It gains potential energy in the climb, and that energy gain doesn't come out of nowhere. If we do nothing else, this potential energy gain comes at the cost of a reduction of kinetic energy, meaning we slow down. So we can do a brief zoom climb, giving up some airspeed which we trade for an altitude gain. But that only lasts so long. Sustained climb is not possible this way, because if we try to keep climbing, at some point we're out of airspeed. A roller coaster is a helpful analogy. The cars on the coaster speed up going downhill and slow down when going uphill. Instead of the lift created by wings, it is carried by the tracks. But other than that, a glider or an airplane at idle power is very much like a roller coaster. In flight, with the elevator, you can change the angle of attack of the wings, which in turn affects how much lift is generated, and with more or less lift you can curve your flight path, or, as Newton called it, change the aircraft's motion. Think of it as if you were designing your own roller coaster tracks right in front of the aircraft, tracks which the airplane then follows, but as the aircraft gains or loses altitude, there's a constant trade between potential and kinetic energy, just like on the roller coaster. To gain altitude, you have to sacrifice speed. And to gain speed, you have to sacrifice altitude. That is true for roller coasters, for cars, or bicycles on rolling hills, and for aircraft as well. So how can an airplane keep climbing without slowing down? Well, we need to add power. That seems to be stating the obvious, but here's another reminder of your high school physics class. Power is defined as work done over time. Energy, with a kinetic, potential, or in some other form, is the capacity to do work. And work is when a force causes the displacement of an object over a distance. Say, for example, lifting an airplane with a certain weight up by some number of feet. Yes, in physics, that climb we do in the aircraft is work, and the climb or work, done over a certain time, think vertical speed, is called power. In fact, if you look up the definition of one horsepower, you will find it is the power necessary to lift a mass of 33,000 pounds, one foot, in one minute. Or, my 3,300 pound Bonanza can climb 1,000 feet per minute with 100 excess horsepower. Excess meaning I start with the power my engine makes, adjust for propeller efficiency, and subtract what is needed to sustain just the forward motion, and then what is left at that point is the excess power which allows sustained climb, which offsets the loss of speed or kinetic energy which would otherwise result from my climb. While we're at it, let's also talk about a couple of related things. The first is Vy, or the airspeed at which the best rate of climb is achieved. 
as the rate of climb is directly proportional to the excess horsepower available, best rate of climb happens when we minimize the amount of horsepower needed to sustain forward flight, which maximizes the excess horsepower. As we climb, our total available horsepower is reduced, at least with normally aspirated engines. So there's less and less excess horsepower available. That explains why your rate of climb is reduced at higher altitudes. And at some point, 100% of the available power is needed for forward flight, and there's none left to climb any higher. That is called the absolute service ceiling. The second thing I want to bring up here is an old wife's tale that you will frequently see on the internet. And that is the assumption that in a descent, less lift is needed than in level flight. And that as a result, we can fly slower than the straight and level stall speed in a steady descent without stalling. And like with so many old wives tales, the problem is that there's actually a little bit of a valid point there. An extreme example helps. An airplane doing aerobatics and flying straight down, vertically, to the earth, does not need any lift from the wings. What keeps the upward and downward forces in balance is the drag of the airplane, which offsets the weight. And a military jet with so much thrust that it can climb vertically also does not need to produce lift in this climb, because the thrust from the engines offsets the weight. Those are extreme examples. What about more realistic cases? In a steady descent with constant airspeed and a constant vertical speed, the forces of flight must again be balanced, because if they weren't, according to Mr. Newton, we would have some acceleration, not steady motion. What does that look like? In level flight, the lift and weight vectors were exactly opposite, but in a descent, or in a climb for that matter, the picture looks different. Lift is by definition perpendicular to the relative wind, so the lift vector alone does not offset the weight anymore. Weight still points straight down to the earth, of course, but the sum of lift plus drag can offset weight. And a little trigonometry tells us that the ratio of lift in the descent to the lift in level flight is the cosine of the descent angle. At a three degree glide angle, think a normal instrument approach, you can see that lift is barely reduced at all. Six degrees? No, still within half of 1% of what we need in level flight. 15 degrees? That's five times steeper than a normal instrument approach, and still our required lift is reduced by a mere 3.5%. Your stall speed may now actually be reduced by a knot or so, but at that angle you'll be rushing to the ground so fast that stall speed probably isn't your concern. So yes, you do need a little less lift in the descent, but the difference is so small that it's insignificant. And the same is true in a steady climb, where the weight of the aircraft is offset by the combined forces of lift and thrust. So not just don't you need more lift in the climb than in level flight, you actually need a tiny little bit less lift in steady climb compared with level flight. So there you have it. Excess power, not lift, is what allows an airplane to climb. Your rate of climb is dependent on how much excess power you have. And while lift changes briefly as you transition between level flight and climbs and descents, once a steady climb or descent has been established, the amount of lift your wings need to create is virtually the same as in level flight, unless your climb or descent angle is very steep. Thanks for watching. And as always, a special thank you to my supporters on Patreon, including Eileen and Jim, Michael, Patrick from Berlin, Germany, and Jack, who all signed up since my last video. As always, I appreciate if you hit like and subscribe to help me grow the channel. See you soon in the next video, or maybe it's fun and fun in a couple of weeks. Bye bye, and fly safe.